For 5G, as with the previous generation of technologies, the most key asset is spectrum. Therefore, it's extremely important to maximize the value of spectrum. In the following time, we're going to address two aspects of doing it. First, we're going to look at why contiguous band is very, very helpful. And then we're going to address the spectrum sharing. First, remember when we address the 2.6 gigahertz, there are two modes of allocation. Compared to the allocation mode of FDD plus TDD combination, the mode with band 41 removes the need for garbage. Moreover, the contiguous band has two key advantages. One, it could reduce the number of required network modulars. Even though we do have available in the market a single modular with IBW as large as 400 megahertz. Second, even if it's possible to cover two non-contiguous bands with one single modular using carrier aggregation, there's a still associate overhead with the carrier aggregation that needs to be taken into account. In the transition to 5G, we probably can all agree that 5G and LTE are going to coexist for a long time. If we do have sufficient new spectrum, preferably we will go with NR only for the new spectrum. However, in many cases, there is a need where we would like to accommodate both LTE and NR with the same spectrum. Therefore, some of the sub 3G bands can be gradually migrated to NR for the sake of a better coverage or better uplink. There are actually three ways to accommodate both LT and NR with the spectrum assets. First is by static refarming of part of the legacy frequency bands. For example, we can refarm 10 MHz out of 20 MHz of LTE for NR. Or we can accommodate both technologies with 20 MHz. The key values of DSS lies its flexibility, i.e on-demand spectrum allocation based on the traffic from one single technology. Compared to static farming, DSS can possibly allocate more resources to one technology when there's more traffic from that side, thus improving the overall spectrum efficiency. The third and the ideal approach is to add FTTNR onto a new spectrum, like 700 MHz in a few countries. For the scheduling the FDDDSS in a frequency domain, the minimum scheduling granularity is RB, meaning that we can change the allocation to LT or NR from RB to RB. In the time domain, it can switch every millisecond. That's also possible to have different priority settings for sharing, or we can prioritize LTE by giving a higher portion of traffic to LTE, or we can set up a, a fair sharing between LTE and NR. This can be extremely useful as the starting phase of 5G when we have low penetration of 5G devices and we would like to assign smaller portion of traffic to NR. But Dynamic spectrum sharing is no free lunch. Since we are accommodating both LTE and NR with the same spectrum, the reference signals of LTE, such as uh, CRIS, are sent no matter what. Here comes the LTE-CRIS rate matching, which means the GNOB would have to punch out the resource elements corresponding to the LTE-CRIS and do not fill the data. The terminals need to punch out the CRS resource elements as well. In 3GPP specification, it is mandatory for the UEs to signal whether it supports DSS and in which band. In case of non-support of DSS of certain terminals, it can be refused to access the network. In terms of the device ecosystem, we already have the mainstream chipset vendors being supporting DSS. Now regarding the overhead for the CRS, it is always there, no matter whether there's an LT traffic being sent. The LT overhead for NR is even higher 
if we have a full port compared to two port, the overhead can represent up to 30% of capacity for the NR without one single LT bit being sent. We do have some approaches to alleviate the problem, for example, by using MBSF and subframe. But it also comes at some sacrifice of the performance of LTE legacy terminals before TM9. For the next step, we are planning to continue to improve our DSS with the hybrid DSS. By hybrid DSS, we mean we can have a NR with larger bandwidth than LTE. For example, 25 megahertz for NR and 20 for LTE. Thus, we can have a uh, exclusive NR portion where we put in all the NR signaling to avoid the conflict with LTE signaling. Meanwhile, in a shared portion, since we don't have NR signaling, that gives higher capacity for the LTE. The value of hybrid DSS are multiple facets. One, since NR signaling exists only in the NR exclusive portion of spectrum, there's no need for LTE and BSFN, thus no impact on the LTE experiences. Two, it is possible to have a larger NR bandwidth than 20 MHz as of today. Three, better compatibility with 5G devices. 5G devices which does not support DSS can still access the exclusive portion of NR. Four, short latency services are for the NR exclusive portion since there's no need to wait for its share of RB, it reduces the latency. For TDD DSS, it is managed rather differently. Every sometime, the uplink, downlink PRB usage or the number of users is being uploaded. And every sub minutes, that is decision needs to be made whether to be switching between LT and NR based on the low stats from different technologies and uh, priority policy. One carrier can be used by only one technology at one point of time. Regarding how to switch one carrier between LT and NR, LT via the silent mode setting and NR via uh, active BWP configuration. In summary, we have addressed two key subjects in maximizing the spectrum value. One is the importance of having contiguous and a large span of spectrum. It can help lower the cost, improve the capacity, and improve the efficiency. Second, we have addressed the true pros and cons of dynamic spectrum sharing. DSS brings great flexibility on the table. That's why it drews a lot of interest. But it's not silver bullet either. It brings overhead since we are accommodating both technologies with the same spectrum. Therefore, the choice between DSS and static NR reforming needs to be made case by case, network by network. This is all for this section on how to maximize spectrum value. Thank you.